Yes, happy Friday. We've got a really exciting special YouTube live for you. Uh, obviously, you know me, Adam. We've got Carl and then with us today as well as Kostan. Kostan's a really special, uh, special guy to Carl and I. He, uh, he not only is arguably one of the more successful students we've ever had in the program, uh, but beyond that, He's, uh, he's also one of our own. So Kostan's elevated and grown to the point where he, he works with us as a coach in Dealmaker Academy. Uh, that tells you how well he's doing as a dealmaker. So Kostan, glad to have you today. And uh, uh, Carl, Thank you, uh, you alive over there? Absolutely. Yeah. Looking forward to the call. It's uh, We were just talking about how the weeks are kind of flying by while we're all uh, in quarantine. The UK started to relax some of its restrictions. You can go out a lot more now. And um, I, I think we're starting to get back to normal. I know, Coastline, you're in London. Yep. It's a couple of hundred miles away from me. Uh, I think London's going to come out of the lockdown before the rest of the country. But I'm just itching to get back to the States, Adam. You know, it, it, it's 10 weeks since I was last in Baltimore. Um, and it's it's crazy, you know, whilst it's been amazing to spend time in the in the country at home, um, I really can't wait to get on a plane and kind of get back. I'm worried about my BA miles and my status. Uh, I get <laughs> I'm pretty back. sure they're going to, I'm pretty sure they're going to extend those for you. You don't have to worry yeah, about that. Looking forward to getting back. But, um, but no, and then, you know, it, it's like with a lot of the students that that we um, that we talk to that have, have come into the program with no experience, have really taken the action and and had a really defining purpose for why they wanted to be a deal maker and, and all the benefits that, that that gives you. And it just makes me so proud that you know I built the system three and a half four years ago and. We've had some unbelievable people like Coastal that have come through it. I've took the action. I've got some amazing results. And um, yeah, Coastal, you'll have to update us. But I know you've bought multiple businesses um, since uh, since you started the journey. And I think we've known each other about three and a half, four years. Uh, I remember our friend's anniversary was on Facebook uh, quite recently. And uh, and I know I was joking with you last time we spoke that uh, this is the first time since we've met that I've actually got longer, I've got shorter hair than you because I've, <laughs> you guys know, I cut my own hair a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so, so um, uh, you know, today, was, today was, was always supposed to be a student success story day. Uh, a student, Eric, uh, just closed on a business last week in the US, nice $8 million a year in revenue business. Fortunately, Eric got tied up and had to take care of some stuff. So he wasn't able to join us. So today, we are live with Kostan, uh, and Kostan is not only a student, Kostan's a coach with us at Dealmaker Academy. He's, he's graduated and grown his, his dealmaking skills to, to be able to do that, and we're thrilled to have him. So uh, we're going to uh, kind of go through Kostan's background, his story a little bit, some of the deals he's done, and uh, you guys will have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, just like any Q&A of Carl, of myself, and uh, while we've got Kostan, uh, he's, he's obviously able to to answer as well. Um, I do have a, uh, a couple questions to, uh, <clears throat> to call out to, uh, but we'll get to those uh, after we talk to Kostan. Let's just uh, do some quick shout outs. We've got, uh, we've got Geraldine. Hi, Geraldine. Good to see you again. We've got Mansa. We've got Jeff Furman. We've got Jax. We've got a whole bunch of people on the call. Um, so uh, it's great to have you guys. Give us a quick shout out. Tell us, uh, tell us where you're from. Yeah, yeah. Let us know, guys. You're on the call. We uh, we appreciate the interaction and uh, and we're thankful you guys come um, because at the end of the day, our goal is to support you and serve you. And it's really important to, to be able to interact with you in this way. Uh, so thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Uh, so hi, Lisa. How are you? Um, uh, Lisa's a stalwart. She's pretty much on every live, uh, Carl. Uh, yeah. Certainly thankful for it as well. I know. But uh, well, great. So, Kostan, um, let's talk about you for a quick minute. Uh, you know, maybe tell us for a few seconds, uh, obviously, who you are, your background, and uh, uh, kind of lead us up into the journey to where you uh, where you found Carl. Yeah. So, uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, Carl, for having me here. 
Um, so I think we're going back 2016, I believe, Carl. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So I am. Um, the program, you were what? You're one of the first 10 students, I think, that came into the program. Yeah, I, I still remember you in the, in the blue suit when we met in London. Uh, yeah, you know. I know, I know. Uh, it, was, it was really good stuff. So my background, um, I'm an accountant. Uh, not that I've always been an accountant. I've always been a, a small business space. Um, I'm, I am, from, you know, say going back to about 2005 when I came in the UK. Before that, I was running a... Um, a chicken. I was actually supplying chicken to Nando's, not in the UK, but in Uganda. So I was always used to really small businesses. Um, and then when I came, I decided that I would take some time off and, and go back to school and, um, and study for accountancy. So then obviously I qualified for, um, for SCCA. Uh, and then I worked in a practice before, before starting my own practice. Um, and the practice was really for small businesses and most of the um, clients were contractors. Um, so towards 2016 in running my small practice, um, obviously the, um, the chance I always wants more money. So they decided to call on, um, um, actually close the, um, they the beefed up the R35. Um, and then which meant that I was going to lose uh, more than half of my clients because the NHS, all the nurses who were contracting had to go back. Um, and so, I had to do really something that was, um, you know, so big that could have to change back and give me the income that, you know, I was going to lose. And that's how I was, um, you know, eating my ice cream, scrolling through Facebook that I then bumped onto Carl's advert. Um, then I scrolled in and jumped in on the, on the webinar in the evening and um, um, it really took action, bought the course, um, you know, watched the entire thing in about a week. Um, and then I, I couldn't wait to, you know, to start the, um, the deal making journey. Um, so after the course, I decided then to, um, you know, reach out to a couple of, um, agents or brokers, whichever you want to call them. Um, I, I got three deals that came through, um, and I engaged all the three companies. And I remember one was an IT company, um, in the, um, um, in the medical space, they were supplying some of the. They, they had software, but equally selling some of the hardware stuff. Um, the other one was also another software company in the, um, in the property space. So they would crop all the, um, the property uh, listings in some of the agents' um, websites, and then they would congregate them in, in one place that really redistribute that. And the other one was uh, business support um, run by a French lady um, who was really supporting French, expanding in London. Um, and so she wasn't doing a lot of accounting, but she was doing more business support and actually showing them their way around, um, around the UK. So, you know, cutting the story short, um, I jumped on, um, on having evaluated the three of those. Um, I decided that I was going to buy the business support because I could then um, expand my accounting services to these clients. So that made sense to me. Um, and yeah, so Carl, that is how I got my first business. The rest is history. Oh, the rest is like not just history. history. Yeah, the rest is not just history. Come on now. There's, uh, there's a few details you've left out, my friend. Uh, yeah. but, I think, but I think what's important, right, is, is Kosan was like many of you guys. You, you either saw an advertisement or, or some kind of ad for, for the program. And here we are three, three and a half, four years later, and Kosan owns multiple businesses. And, uh, and is nothing less than a certifiable deal maker. There's no doubt about it. So why don't you dive a and little he's never, bit? Go ahead. He's, he's, and he's never invested any of his own money. So, yeah, so I am going to jump into probably a couple of deals I've closed. Um, yeah, tell uh, us about the first one. Tell us about the two, Brad. So, yeah, so the first one, um, Obviously, I was losing. I was losing money in a in a in a few months. Um, you know, given the chancellor's um, announcement, so I didn't have a lot of money left on on in my bank. So what happened is that when when I um when I established when I established uh, that I wanted to buy um, that business, that's Akian Futura. So I then looked at the um the financing bit, 
um, I didn't have the money. So I needed to raise, um, to raise the money. Um, my, you know, just like everybody, you know, you're used to the high street banks. And my first guts was like, you know, go to the, go to Barclays, I back with Barclays, go to Barclays and get some money. Well, I arranged the meeting and once in there, the guy, evaluated it and he's like, well, you've never bought a business before, so we're not going to give you the money. I'm like, okay, um, I'm out of here. I, I didn't give up. Then I tried to use the enterprise, um, you know, Carl, you know, the, 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 it's the enterprise. PFG. Enterprise <laughs> Finance Guarantee, yeah. That's correct. Um, and I was getting it, working it through it with a guy from NatWest. Um, that didn't work out either. So I needed to, to look at invoice financing. Um, invoice financing didn't really work for me well um, at that point because uh, the invoices were quite old. Um, and there was way in which, you know, you know, most of them were old. And because the clients had bigger businesses in France, um, when they did credit check them, they found that some of the businesses they had in the UK were smaller compared to the size they had because they were mostly expanding into the UK. So um, I couldn't use invoice financing. I couldn't use my bank. So I was kind of stuck. And I'm like, what do I do? But like any deal maker would do you have to really go back to the drawing board and be creative in how you actually finance this. So I remember going to, um, um, I got one of the, I raised uh, on a cash flow lend, I raised um, um, about, you know, 20,000 um, on a cash flow lend. I wanted, uh, I was trying to get a hundred K for a, for a fast, you know, for a fast um, a payment on closing. Um, I didn't get all the money I needed. Uh, so I had to renegotiate with the seller. So I go back and say, look, we can't do this, but if we give you, you know, about 20K um, on the deal, can we then pay you on a monthly basis um, after that? So, and, and she accepted it. She said, that's fine. So we paid um, the first small installment and then on a monthly basis, we started paying um, bigger installments um, until our first closing was done in about, you know, six, seven months. So, and then after the seven months, we then obviously borrowed, we could then borrow from the business and then pay the second um, and the third. So yeah, it was creativity to make sure that we get that payment done. Um, and yeah, so happily into the business and um, enjoying the fruits and um, of being a, a, an investor and a business owner. So Coastal, when you renegotiated the deal and you pushed a lot more of the payment into seller financing, how... How much did the relationship that you'd built with that seller and her kind of seller psychology, her mindset at the time, how much of that was, was kind of relevant to that switch? Yeah, so I really, I really had a good relationship with her. Um, and that is the only reason why I could um, renegotiate that. Um, so I, I remember um, because she, in, her, in her mind, I was the rightful owner of the business. Um, and in a way, um, she was helping me to transition into that transaction. A, by the time um, actually we renegotiated, um, she had already given me a right to actually um, second one employee. So I had already sent in an employee um, to work on the transition as I walked through the financing. So the relationship was key to this renegotiation. Um, it, you know, it was a key to, to actually this deal work. So without it, I wouldn't have renegotiated it. Yeah. And I think, okay. I think that goes back to one of the things we, we talk about quite a bit, which is relationships at the end of the day are how a deal maker survives, how a deal maker is successful is, is, are you building your network? Are you building relationships with, with accountants and attorneys and wealth managers and, and financiers and, and are you able to leverage those networks to both find deals and then also once you find deals to build a relationship with a seller so that they're willing and able to, to ride the wave that is a deal, right? Uh, I've never in my entire life ever seen a deal that didn't have a hiccup somewhere along the way, no matter how fast the deal or no matter how long the deal took. There's always a hiccup somewhere. Uh, and if you don't have that underlying relationship that sits beneath all the, uh, the stress and struggle that is going through a deal, um, you know, you're, you're just not going to, to be successful 
because you need that relationship. You need people to understand your intentions, your desires, your goals, your ambitions. At the same time, you need to understand their desires, goals, and ambitions, and how do you merge the two so both parties walk away feeling like a winner, and that's that's super critical. Uh, so, Kostan, I couldn't, couldn't agree more that the relationship is uh, imperative. No, it is really key, yeah. If you, if you could... If you could go back and, you know, you said you binged Carl's course in a week. You just binged the course. Um, if you could, if you could like tell someone, what was the, what was the most important thing you got out of it? Uh, not necessarily from a, a skill set or anything like that, but just what was the most important thing you got out of it that you wouldn't have been able to do otherwise? Um, so for me, and I'll take you back to um, before the uh, the course itself. So obviously there was um, a free webinar that you know yeah. Carl was giving. Uh, I don't know whether you still give that, Carl. Um, but I think for me, going through that webinar, um, what struck me was: is this possible? Can you, you know, can you do an, an LB or on a small business? Um, I had. By the time I went into into Carl's course, I had read the um, the Barbarians at the Gate. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's it's somewhere here. I had read the Barbarians at the Gate, and I thought, no, nah, this is a game for for only big boys. You know, you can go to the banks and you can you know raise bonds and then get that money, go pay down the down payment, and whatever happens. Obviously, you know the story, Adam. Um, but for me, going through the course um, was if this can be done on a small, in a small business space, then I have no excuse not to do it. So for me, it was an eye opener of the opportunity that is available for everybody who actually there listens and say, okay, this is real and I can do it. So for me, um, probably I might be different from other people, but not necessarily that I have any skills that other people don't have because as an accountant, you can hire an accountant. You don't need to be an accountant to do this. But for me, looking at, you know, at the numbers and knowing how the numbers work, but getting that psychology to say that actually this thing works for me was, was the whole thing that blew me up in the course. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think people need to, I think the biggest thing I've heard and, and you've kind of answered it is, it's the realization and confidence that with Carl's training in, in education, you know that you can do this and you can be successful and you've got the tools to do it, right? Uh, yeah. And I think, I think you've just affirmed that as well, which is, which is great. And, you know, frankly, it's why Carl built the course. It's why we do what we do at Dealmaker Well Society, right? We want to teach and train and, and help as many people as possible get that realization that they can change their life and, and move it in a path in a way that will allow them to, to never go back to where they were or never go back to what, what they are, whether it's an employee for someone, a terrible boss, just, or just frankly putting in all that blood, sweat and tears for someone else to make a ton of money. Um, and yeah, so, and, and what, what's really interesting <clears throat> about, about the program and you can apply this really to kind of anything in life. You know, it doesn't matter how good the program is, how much information is there, education tools, all the stuff that we pack into the dealmaker CEO. It's knowledge is only 20% of the game. It's all about the execution, isn't it? It's all about actually doing the work and, and, and what drives human beings to do things is really having a defined why and a real kind of purpose for why they want to do it. And I think Coastal is a great example of somebody that, um, you know, saw this as an opportunity to build some wealth and build some freedom in his life. And that kind of was a really defined purpose for him. He was losing the income that he was currently generating. So uh, this was really important for him and for his family, to, you know, to do it. And, um, like anything in life, you need that spark. You need to have that mindset that you'll commit to doing something and you'll follow through, you know, no matter what. And it doesn't matter how good the program is. If you don't have that burning desire to improve the standard of your life, however you want to do it, whether it's legacy or after, wealth creation, cash flow, freedom, work-life balance, pride, assurance, you know, it doesn't matter. You've really got to have that dialed in. 
which is why in the program, we, we spend that first module really kind of honing in on your why. Um, it, it's one thing to know your what, what type of business that I want to, I want to own. Um, but it's really about that why. And I think Coastons a great example of somebody that, that just had that real purpose and, you know, would, would never give up. And if you don't have that why, when the bank turned him down for the money and he had to go back and refi the deal with the seller, uh, people that don't have that mindset really dialed in, they'll, they'll, they'll just give up and go do something else. And, you know, Coaston is not one of those people. And if I look at all the successful students, the hundreds of students that have closed deals, some of them our audience have met, some of them they haven't yet. I can boil down the difference that makes the difference with people is that commitment to making this happen and, and leveraging the power of the system and the tools. It, it's, like, it's like getting fit. You, you can join the most sophisticated gymnasium in the world. You can hire the best personal trainer in the world. If you don't show up, you're not going to get fit. And it's the same with this program. You've got to have those, you know, you've got to have a desire to, to kind of do the work and, and follow through. So Coast On, I want to applaud you, you know, for that. It's, it's really good. Oh, thanks, Carl. <clears throat> so there was another deal that you closed um, when we were at the uh, the Academy uh, Mastermind Meetup. So for our friends, um, some of our friends on this call who are in our Academy program, I know um, I know Faith and Roger from San Diego are here. Hi, guys. Um, you were at the uh, the meetup in San Diego where you know, we took Coast on with us. And, and I, I remember Coast on when we did the London meetup um, in late September of last year, I remember you closed a deal actually in the room. Um, and it was a really, really cool deal and a really clever negotiation that, that, that you did. So um, talk us through that deal, because that's whilst I think your first deals are always your best. You know, I talk about my first deal when I bought that transport company in 2008, my, my first personal LBO. Um, I'll never forget my first real deal when I was on Wall Street back in the early 90s. But but my favorite deal that you've talked to me about is, is the one you closed in the room in London. Yeah, so um, no, thanks, Carl, for, you know, for asking on that one. So it was an exciting, actually. It was an exciting transaction. Um, what happened was that um, I, um, I had originated the deal on the Monday, um, and then I called the um, I called the broker and say this this deal looks a little bit, you know, it looks weird because the weird thing about that deal was it looked distressed. Um, it looked I knew I knew because we were running because by then I was running the um, uh, uh, business in childcare, so I knew the margins. I knew what you can do in the in the childcare space. So when I saw the deal, I thought there's something about this deal that I need to know. So rather than putting it in a corner and say, this is crap, forget about it. I just wanted to know, you know, why it's what it is. So they were turning about, you know, um, 700, uh, about 700,000. Um, and on the books, you know, it, it didn't look like they had enough money uh, on, the profit, on the profit side. Called the broker and the broker said, well, if you want this deal, you really have to be fast on it. Um, and I say, okay, give me the accounts, full accounts. I saw that. And I say, can you book, can you book for me um, um, a meeting? And then she comes back and say, can you, can you see the, uh, the lady tomorrow? It's like, okay, I can't see her tomorrow because, you know, I need, I was supposed to be somewhere. So I said, okay, I'll see her on Wednesday. Then I went and see, I saw the lady. Um, we discussed the deal we looked at, you know, why she was struggling. Obviously, she had a few, um, a few issues um, uh, uh, with the regulator. Um, but then, when you looked at the numbers, it was a great business to have. So we agreed that she was going to give me the deal, and um, she was going to actually um, walk out of the business. We start running the business, and we would pay her about three months after that. Um, yeah. So that was actually, in in reality, I don't think that I'm going to ever get a deal better than that um that it was your closing payment that you made three months after you bought so you did make a closing payment on the day you took over the business you made it three months later there was enough cash flow in those three months coming through the business yeah. you to make that payment to the seller 
to make that payment. So yeah, that's how that's how the working of that deal was. So that's yeah, crazy, he brother. didn't have to raise them um, to raise capital uh, at the time for the deal. Um, it was just after um, that I would have to pay that. Yeah, and, and the best part about that, right, is uh, you know you ended up walking away with something that's putting and will continue to put significant real dollars in your pocket. Uh, I know we've talked before around you kind of reconfiguring some of the management of the business and all that other stuff. And, and at the end of the day, right, you're going to end up with an asset for basically a song and a dance outside of your, you know, your efforts. And, and that's exactly what we want for people. Right. But it all comes back to, you got to be able to put the work in and you've got to be able to have the commitment to do this. Um, you know, Deals like this don't fall fall out of the tree necessarily. You've got to put some effort in and build relationships, build your network, build the framework to be a deal maker. Again, this is stuff that Carl Carl talks about and teaches about in the course. But in reality, the best way to do this is to just take action. Uh, start with what Carl was talking about with knowing your why, like what is your purpose and why are you doing it, and then from there you've got the confidence and skill sets to make it happen. So super exciting. I mean, just super pumped. I mean, and that's not even the big deal. <laughs> that's not even the big deal. So Coastons trying to become the biggest deal maker of them all. So I don't know what you can or can't share about uh, your negotiations slash consulting for equity situation. But uh, if you can share any of that, I'm sure people would love to hear uh what a potential eight digit deal looks like yeah um so uh that's or should uh, i say nine digit technically it's nine digits so the um so no we um uh, i got an opportunity to um uh to work with with one of the companies that you know um, i had been an accountant for uh, but then we had um when a big contract came through um there was none uh, the, uh, this, uh, the owner said, well, Costin, can we not go and do this together? Um, so that is how I actually ended up doing, um, we ended up doing a deal in, um, in the oil and gas. Um, the, the, the deal is, is huge, um, you know, from, from being um, just an accountant, probably trying to chase the, um, the, um, the small contractors uh, to actually getting into discussing deals worth um, really tens and and tens of millions. So that's um, that's a that's a deal. That's the biggest I've done so far. Um, and and I am probably not going to divulge much because as we speak, we are trying to put um, um, all the all the uh, all the um, we're trying to put you know the whole plan in place on how we can um, generate even like uh, like um, Adam says, whether it's nine figure, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, it's a deal. Um, and given that um, it's it's a government contract, so I'm, I'm probably not going to just go running um, telling this on a line. Oh, fair enough. And I think, you know, once, once you close that deal um, and you can talk about it, we'll, we'll get you back on. I think I'll, Adam, that'll be a very interesting. Kind yeah, of absolutely. Thought yeah, thought. absolutely. And, and certainly, certainly don't want you to share anything you can't share. Uh, but at the end of the day, Kostan's in the middle of, of, frankly, leveraging some of the skills. Again, he, he started learning um, from the course and ultimately hats off to Kostan for, for, for taking this stuff and running with it. Uh, I don't think, Carl, you've had anyone do a deal that's that's in the nine nine digits. So. No, there's, there's somebody in the program that's bought 73 businesses in a roll-up. Um, and that's, um, I think, is 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 revenue in that business now is uh, is probably nine figures. Um, he's certainly got a nine figure valuation on on his yeah, portfolio. Absolutely. But um, but yeah, and, and it's what's really interesting when you know when I when I think about him, he, he rolled up in the uh, in the healthcare space, and I think about Coastal, and I think about a lot of the other deal makers that once they've closed that first deal and they've kind of gone on. It reminds me of, of what you say all the time, Adam, and you're right, that you're only kind of one deal away. And, and, and you are, because once you've closed one deal, it really transforms you as a deal maker, both in terms of your credibility, your confidence, the way you negotiate, you have a different kind of swagger, 
So, so Kosan, after you've cl- after you closed your first deal, you know how different was it going into you know your second and third deal, and then all the other deals that you're into now? It, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? You go so far up the learning curve just through one actual process because you're you're living and breathing just that first deal. You've got all the emotions of the deal. You know what's happening, the whole process. Um, it's uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Just how far you go just from one single closed deal. Yeah, so now to, to put it in perspective, I mean, on the first, um, the first meeting I had with the seller, you know, I was really nervous. Um, you know, you ha- your, sweat, your, your hands are sweating and you're not sure what you're gonna say, what they will, um, they will take from you. Because in your mind, you're thinking, hey, hang on a minute. I'm looking to leverage the assets of the business um, to acquire it. And this is, this is abnormal. Um, but then once you actually do the first deal, then the confidence that you actually draw from there going into the next deal um, is incredible. You, you can do anything because you walk in, you know, the, you, 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 know, um, you know what you're going to do from day one. You know how you're going to negotiate the deal. And above all, you know how you're going to finance it because you already now have um, a couple of contacts that you can raise finance to actually pay for the deal. So it really increases your um, your confidence. It you know the odds are now on your side. So it's it's just just go do one deal, however small the the deal will be, but the um the you know the confidence that that gives you that you can then walk in because let's put it this way. If I hadn't really done, um, uh, you know, those deals before, I don't think that I would have um, approached like, you know, the, the deal we did in, in the oil and gas because I wouldn't have done it. Um, and and to be honest, the reason that I managed to do that deal was the fact that the guy that, you know, that, you know, he, the guy looked at me and he said, you've got everything that I don't have. Um, so you're the guy that we can go and do this together. And because the way we then looked forward was that even if we were to supply this contract, we needed to buy more companies to actually be able to supply the contract. So the skill set on, on deal making, even to actually fulfill our obligation, was a key for me to actually buy into this, uh, into this company. So that, you know, it really gives you the confidence that you need um, to do anything. Yeah, that is amazing. Uh, so let's let's pivot to some Q&A, guys, if you're good with that. Uh, <clears throat> before we do that, massive amount of folks uh, on the live and really appreciate it. Called some out before, but we've got Robert, David, House Collection. Carl, we're continuing with the great names. We've got Tony. Yeah, House we've collection. got, we got Barry uh, from John, Ireland. We've yeah, got Steve Stephen from Wigan, yeah. which is probably 20 miles from where I'm sat right now um, in the Ribble Valley countryside. we got... Houston, Texas, we've got Nigeria, we've got San Diego, we've got, um, you know, Jeff working on four deals, good Jeff, we've got Wales with Dean, uh, we've got Richard in Hampshire, we've got Michael in Swindon, we've got John, we've got Richard, um, Chrome Clapper, our friend from last week, Kosen is a star, uh, certainly <laughs> is, you've got Nelson from uh, from Florida, Um Thank you. Yeah, there's there's some great questions. Great question, Coaston, for you from from Geraldine. Okay. Um, I'll I'll read it out, then I'll pass you back to Adam uh, for the other questions. So Geraldine, team Rockin. So it sounds like it took six or seven months for your first deal. How long did it take you to do the due diligence and realize the original finance path wasn't working? Well, that's a that's a good question. Um, so from the onset, I did what everybody would do. You would, um, I thought, you know, I thought I would raise the money. So I had gone in uh, three installments, uh, one at closing, one at first at Yao. Actually, I, I was aggressive on this company. I had one on year one, one on 16 months after closing, and the other one um, another six months later after that. So I was paying for it in two years. So. Because I knew that the business was cash rich, um, it needed just a bit of pivot. So once I was turned down by Barclays, I was turned uh, turned down by the enterprise scheme. At that point, 
I realized that my original plan isn't going to work. And that was within about um, a month and a half. So at that point, I started focusing on renegotiating um, the finance and then get it slightly smaller. And that's how um, I quickly came to the um, uh, to raise that small amount and close the deal. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So one other question, uh, also uh, also from the same person for you, Kostan. Uh, did you put a GM in the uh, the childcare business? Yes. The, the one uh, the one you just bought last fall. Yes, correct. There is a GM in the business. Yeah. So so Kostan's not working every day in the business uh, at all, uh, which is great. Uh, it's just a business that presumably will tick along and put money in your pocket. Uh, and as a former accountant, just like me, as a former accountant, you'll have someone else do the, uh, the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. So actually, as we speak now, um, even, even on, on the accounting side, um, I, I've got an accountant looking after that. So all the businesses I was at first, I was um, actually running the accountancy myself because I had replaced my lost income um, and that's why I bought the, the, the business support. Um, but then having done the second deal um, and then went on to do uh, more deals, I just realized that the best way for me to do this was to actually just get GMs across board um, and then just wake up, um, look at, you know, we, we do plan together um, and then make sure that the business are running. So. Um, yeah, so I, I'm now hands-free. I have GMs everywhere. Perfect. And, uh, and that's exactly uh, how we all want to be, uh, I would imagine, as owner-investors. So a um, couple uh, other people will give some shout-out to uh, your fellow friend and coach, John McElroy, watching live. So hi, Big John. Hope you're doing well you up, uh, up in Canada. Um, so uh, John was John was on YouTube with us, I guess about a month ago. Uh, we did a live red light green light on YouTube. Uh, we did a, a deal review, um, and as you know, John John puts those things together better than anyone. Uh, and uh, he, he's, he's a genius. He's yeah. a genius. Yeah, I couldn't well, agree with you more. John's John's our head coach in the uh, in the Dealmaker Academy program, and he he also works um, in our Prox Private Equity group as well. And, and another a quick shout out to Richard Tunner, um, who's a great friend of ours, been in the program a while. Um, Richard, Adam, and I have just acquired a technology cybersecurity company in the, in the UK through Prox. That business is doing really really well. Adam, I don't know if you saw the update. From yep. IGM this morning, um, they're killing it right now. Um, it, it's kind of thriving through COVID, not just surviving. Lots of their clients are uh, reinforcing a lot of their security protocols, and uh, very, very good for um, you know for that business. So, um, got some really interesting questions as well, Adam, um, from from the group. I don't know. Um... Yeah. So, uh, so I've got two questions in particular. Uh, I want to address today, and then we'll get to some of the ones uh, that are here in the chat. Um, so these these came in prior to today, and I just want to I just want to talk about them uh, really for two different reasons. They're very different questions. Uh, I know the person who uh, I know the person who asked this one is uh, is actually watching right now. So uh, so just want to shout out to Daisy. Daisy's uh, Daisy's a very young entrepreneur. Hey Daisy. Uh, uh, from the UK uh, at the ripe old age of 18. Uh, so very exciting to, uh, to see so on. So Daisy's asked us about the possibility of, of buying a business in the US uh, and what does that look like? And then asking questions about the SBA as well. So, so just wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to, to speak to the question, Daisy. And, and there's really two things I wanna cover. First and foremost is you're going to blow all of us away with, with your success, right? If you're 18 years old and already passionate in pursuing entrepreneurial activities, you're, you're going to absolutely crush it. And uh, I think all of us uh, would dare say to, to be jealous of, of the success you might have, because 
none of us started when we were 18 years old and that's and that's pretty incredible um in terms of doing your first deal as a transatlantic deal <laughs> i think that's probably going to be a really tough 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 gig it's it's a hard deal to do even for say carl or myself or even coaston who's here with us today uh transatlantic deals or transition anything right uh they're hard deals right you're dealing with currency differences you're dealing with proximity differences and even for really veteran deal makers those are those are challenges that can be tough to overcome uh understanding the business environment and things like that and that's before we get to the financing and and you've asked a great question which i think applies to many people other than yourself and that's around the sba for uk citizens who are looking to invest in the u.s you know, something that's really incredible uh, is, is while the SBA is predominantly for U.S. businesses, it's exclusively for U.S. businesses, we can't have foreign ownership as a part of those deals. There's just limitations. All SBA loans must have a minimum of 51% U.S. ownership. And a U.S. citizen, a U.S. resident who can be, say, a, you know, a, a U.K. citizen who has U.S. residency, uh, all of those are required to tick that box. In addition to obviously the other challenges that come with an SBA loan, which is you've got to have capital up front. Obviously, Carl and I advocate if you don't have the capital, go find someone who does, plug them into the deal. Um, and then the final thing is personal guarantees. You know, the SBA requires anyone who owns more than 20% of the business, they have to personally guarantee the loan. And unlike in the UK, where you can get personal guarantee insurance, that doesn't exist here in the US, unfortunately. And so if you cannot personally guarantee the loan uh, or be a party to the personal guarantee, unfortunately, you can't own more than 20% of the company. So SBA loans, really, really uh, good types of debt. But for us as dealmakers, the debt of last resort um, for, for those reasons, the complexity and, and some of the loopholes you've got to jump through. So yeah, and, and I, I think that's great. And Daisy's asked a kind of follow-up question in the in the YouTube chat, and and I think it's a really really good question that that I want to kind of touch on. So Daisy's asked, you know, I'm 18, I'm looking to become an owner investor. Is this a good idea? Any advice? So one thing I want to compliment you on, Daisy, is your ambition and your energy and your ability to kind of get into this at such a young age. Um, the one thing that may possibly hold you back from closing deals on your own. It's just, you know, your lack of business experience in general and just your lack of years on earth. But what I, what I want to suggest to you, and, and this applies to kind of anybody, young or old, if, if you've never had any experience in business at all, but you want to run a deal process, is just go and partner with somebody that's got that gray hair like me, has had, you know, some, some miles around the block, has got some business experience because you'll find people through building a network on LinkedIn and all these different things, you'll find people that they don't want to charge to run a deal process, but they've got some uh, sector expertise and some skills that are going to be highly valuable to you in buying a business and closing the deal. So go and partner with those people. And whenever we talk about this, Adam, I think about Peter and Hanif that met uh, at one of our meetups. Hanif, um, even though you know a, a very established business professional owned some businesses, he wanted to buy businesses in the engineering space and had no knowledge of that sector. But he partnered with um, with Peter, who we met at, at the meetup in um, in Manchester, the first one we ever did, um, just over a year ago. And those guys have now combined. You had Hanif with the marketing skills and wanting to be the deal maker and Peter with this kind of engineering knowledge and an older gentleman, they've now gone and bought five businesses. So, so Daisy, the best advice I can give you is keep that entrepreneurial spirit, keep that hunger for wanting to do this at such a, a, a great young age. But my advice is go and partner with some people right now that can kind of complement your energy with some business skills and some business knowledge and hopefully some sector knowledge and then you can go and do deals together and, and you know, don't be despondent owning 50% of businesses at 18. You know, I didn't own a business when I was 18. Uh, you know, Adam, I don't think you did either. Neither did Coast on. Um, you, you, you can own pieces of businesses, you know, really learn from that experience. And then 
you know, by the time you're in your early 20s and you've done some deals and, and you've really been through this process a few times, you're going to be a bona fide deal maker in your own right. And people are going to take you super seriously. And, you know, you could be a billionaire by the time you're 30. Um, there's, it's going to run circles around you and I, Carl. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, um, I'll, I'll have retired by then. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, hand, I'll hand the bat on to you, Daisy. You, you can be the guru in this world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, Daisy, uh, rock on to you, girl. Um, and uh, good luck on your deal-making journey. Um, so next question, uh, and then we'll get to you guys in the chat. And again, we're thrilled to have you. Love the discussion. You guys are crushing it in the chat. So, uh, so thanks for that. Um, we got a question, Carl, that's ultimately at the very end, hey, surplus cash. But there's a little bit more to it. So I'm going to read this out for you guys. And, uh, you know, one thing to note is, you know, we can't generally, we can't really answer specifics on any deal, especially in this setting. We just don't have the ability to understand the mechanics of an individual deal. Uh, we just don't know anything about the business. We don't have the ability to, to set anything in stone. So just bear with us when you guys ask questions that have specifics, because sometimes the best answer we can give is I don't know, or it depends. And uh, so, so bear with us uh, as we get through this. Uh, so I have an IT company that looks promising even through uh, COVID. It's doing $4 million a year in revenue, uh, 700 grand roughly in EBITDA. The business has $1.1 million of cash sitting in the business bank accounts. I want to offer $3 million for the business, but I'm unclear how to structure the offer using the cash sitting in the bank accounts as I project it only needs 350 k of liquidity which would give me roughly 750,000 of surplus cash. So Carl, we've, we've, we've heard questions like this before. How do, how do I work surplus cash yeah. into an offer? And I think broadly, there's some, some things we can say about it, but very specifically, it frankly depends on your relationship with the seller. It depends on the rest of the deal structure. It depends on all these things. So it, it does. So there's two parts to this. So the first part is you first have to determine whether you're asking price, the price you're paying for the business does in fact include the surplus cash. So, um, so the traditional way to do it is when you value a business, you value a business typically on a multiple of its profitability. Um, the average in the UK is between two and a half and three. So, so let, let's, let's say the business is doing a million dollars of profit um, you're buying it for a three times multiple. If the business then has surplus cash, you have to pay for that in addition to what you're paying for the business because it's it's deemed a non-operating asset. The business doesn't need it. And one of the reasons why business owners in the UK stockpile their cash in the business versus businesses in the United States is in the UK, it's a lot more tax advantageous to take money out of a business when you sell it versus taking it out in salary and dividends once you're the owner. It used to be crazily efficient up until about three months ago. Um, in the UK, you have something called the entrepreneur's tax relief and you used to be able to, um, I think it, was, it went as high as 10 million. Um, you could sell 10 million pounds worth of businesses in your lifetime and only pay 10% tax on the proviso that you sold the shares, you owned more than 5% of the shares and you'd owned them for more than 12 months. And then the, the chancellor um, in March decided to lower that down to 1 million. So the first 1 million of proceeds that someone gets is at 10% and then it's 20% thereafter as, as you scale up. So, uh, so that's why UK businesses stop how cash and US businesses don't because the tax situation over there is very, very different. So once you've agreed a deal with a seller, whatever that is, any, and if it includes the surplus cash in the business, you can then use that money to help fund the closing payment. You know, we've just done that with the business we bought with, with Richard Turner. That, in fact, the entire closing payment on that deal was the surplus cash that the business had and you're able to flow that through and that is your closing payment um so you could definitely do it but the first thing you need to determine is does your offer include that surplus cash uh that's the first thing that you need to determine but then to answer your question absolutely you can use it as part of the financing 
Yeah, absolutely. Awesome job there, Carl. Uh, so guys, going to pop through the chat here, see what's, what kind of questions we have. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Lisa, sorry, Lisa, say, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I thought you were looking for a question, and I, I, I had one. I was going to quickly answer, but you go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, Lisa's actually saying, Daisy, uh, it's a good idea to connect. It might be prudent for you to buddy up uh, with another person who has experience in whatever field you're interested in. And yeah, absolutely, right along the lines of, of what we were saying. And this goes for anyone, right? Never be afraid to work with someone, right? Carl, hey buddy, hey partner, never be afraid to work with someone. Uh, and I think, you know, I think the idea is, is the sum of the parts are generally greater you know, than each of them individually. And I think, uh, I think when you find the right partners, uh, it's, it's very important uh, to build that relationship with them and, and find a way to, to grow and scale. So, uh, Adam, Adam, if I can add on that one, um, that is a really good point you're raising. Um, so, just to highlight, so right now, um, I have um, two partners in the US um, and another partner in Australia. Um, and we're closing deals that, you know, I wouldn't have closed in the US without those partners. Um, so yeah, it's, it, works, it works like magic. Um, it really helps. You know, um, like you're talking about the SBA. Uh, I can't put my name on the SBA. I'm not a US citizen. Um, I have my own skill set. They have their own skill set. If it comes to getting a GM who is close to the business, I mean, that's some stuff that you're looking at that you can't do when you're in the UK. Whereas if you have a partner in the US, it's easier for them to then uh, do the recruiting and then you can look after the business. So yeah, it's it's really a good a good thing to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's to me, it's a big key to unlock future success, right? Carl and I in our own business is we wouldn't be where we are if we, we weren't partners together. Uh, whether it's Steelmaker Well Society where we're trying to frankly change the landscape of the business mind space, especially for small businesses or in our own investments and things like that through Prox and otherwise, right? We wouldn't be where we are if we weren't partnered together. Um, and so it's, it's really valuable to, to find that network. Um, uh, so, so Gerald's asked, how do we handle brokers when there's no cash at closing? Uh, Kostin, you can certainly talk about any of the deals you've done with no cash and, you know, happy to back up any answers uh, you provide. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm going to two deals that I would just, um, answer that, used to answer that question. So the first one, um, the one that I literally closed in, in about a week or so, um, and the lady was to be paid in three months. Actually, she had paid the, um, the broker fees and I didn't have to worry about that. So that, that was a worry for her, for her not for me. Um, the, 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 my first deal, um, I actually first proposed to pay her um, about 10K on closing and then pay the rest in, um, in installments. And she said, no, I need to pay the broker 10K. So I need amount more than 10K. So then I knew that I needed to pay her 10K, which would go to the broker, but I needed to also pay her something more. So you always have to um, ask how much are you paying the broker? And then you can figure that out um, in your fast payment. Um, and again, if there is no payment, you can actually also call the broker and then um, negotiate and see whether yeah. you can also pay the broker in yep. installment once you're in the business. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we've done as well. And uh, we're where you call a broker and you say, listen, this deal isn't going to command a, a closing payment for whatever reasons. You know, what does your fee structure look like? It's normally a percentage of the sale price uh, here in the US especially, uh, and also oftentimes in, in the UK as well. And then you work it into part of the deal uh, and you find a way to make it, make it right so everyone feels like they've got some success uh, in it. Uh, hey broker, uh, your fee is supposed to be $50,000. Uh, on this, you know, $500,000 deal, so a 10% fee, let's say. Uh, do you mind if I pay you $65,000? So I'm going to pay you $15,000 more, um, but you've got to be willing to accept your payments from the seller over a period of 24 months as opposed to all up front. So they get to make more money, but they collect their cash lower. So there's so many different ways you can negotiate it uh, when you have that conversation. And more importantly, the relationship with the broker, right? When you deal with brokers, you're building a relationship with two people, 
the seller and the broker, because both are economically vested in the outcome of the negotiations and the business buying, you've got to be comfortable building a relationship with both. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. That? And, you know, yeah, so working with brokers and, and getting them creative, because sometimes, you know, a broker fee is the only thing that stands in the way of you closing the deal. And uh, the broker wants the deal off the books. You, you, you can imagine that if the, if the deal is 100% seller financing, then there's clearly nobody else at the table to buy the business. It's probably been listed for a while. And uh, the broker's potentially nearing the end of their, their selling contract. So this might be the only deal that the broker is going to get. And one, once you agree to take care of their fee and, and roll it into the seller financing payments, what you tend to find is that the broker kind of then starts to straddle both sides of the deal and then starts to kind of help you with the closing to actually get the, the, the deal done. So, um, so that's really interesting. The, there's a couple of really super quick questions, Adam. I'm going to rattle off. Really yeah, quick. bang them out. So bang quick, out. Question, quick question from Jeff. Um, are there any schemes in the UK similar to the SBA? So there are. It's called the Enterprise Finance Guarantee, the EFG scheme. Um, it's not a lender of last resort like the SBA. The EFG that is really there as a top-up loan. So it's really, really hard to only do a deal with an EFG loan. It's normally there as a top-up. So you might have financed real estate, you might have financed receivables or inventory or plant and equipment. And if you're a, you know, let's say you're doing a million pound deal and you're a couple of hundred thousand pounds short, the EFG can come in. It's a government backed scheme through a retail bank. They will top that funding up. The two problems with an EFG loan are number one, you need a sliver of equity. They normally multiply what you put in by four. So you do need a little bit of cash to be able to kind of gross that up. And then they'll want you to sign a personal guarantee. But as Adam mentioned previously, uh, there's a very established PG insurance market um, inside of the UK. So that that's that. Uh, quick question from Daring Drew, another great name. Um, when you partner with someone, do you have a written contract between you or just verbal? So when you partner with somebody to buy a business, the both of you, you'll enter into a shareholders agreement or if you're buying an LLC in the US, your members, not shareholders, and you enter into an operating agreement. That's just the rules between you as owners in terms of how the business works. Um, if you're talking about having a contract whilst you're buying the business, um, it depends on the strength of your relationship, right? You know, if, if it's somebody that you know very, very well and you're really good friends, then often a, a verbal agreement between the two of you to do a 50-50 deal is right. I'd always advocate you have something in writing, um, worst case scenario. But if uh, if you've got a, a phenomenally strong relationship, then uh, a verbal is fine. But once you buy the business, you do need a shareholders agreement or an operating agreement. Um, and then one quick final question from Jacques, who was talking about, you know, if you do a deal and you've got seller financing in play and the business gets into some trouble, you know, what are your options? Well, well, one is um, I would always go back and renegotiate the seller financing with the seller. You will more than likely in your deal when you sign the sale and purchase agreement to buy the business, the seller will have some form of security over the shares of the business and have a right to claw some of that back. Um, in practical terms, that could take years going through a legal system. Um, so it's happened to me a number of times. I've always gone back to the seller um, and renegotiated it. And if there's been something really dramatic that's happened, and that has happened to me before, I lost 40% of my customer base, which was 95% of my profit overnight in, in, a, in an eight-figure business that I acquired. Um, we just gave it away. We sold it for a pound and walked away. My business partner and I had still made, you know, we'd, we'd still split a million pounds out of that deal over three years. You know, didn't get the big exit we hoped for, but we'd not signed any personal guarantee. So we could have just walked away if we wanted to. Instead, we uh, we sold the business for a pound. So uh, there are lots of different ways. Um, you know, if you're not putting any money into the deal and you're not signing a personal guarantee or you have PG insurance, worst case scenario, you can just walk away. Um, and, you know, just learn from the experience. You know, there is no failure in this business. It's all feedback. Um, and from my perspective, 
I've actually learned a lot more as a deal maker when things have gone wrong from all the successes that I've actually had. And, and you'll know if you're in the deal maker CEO program, you know, I tell you about a lot of the war, war stories because I don't want you to make the mistakes that I've made kind of learning on the job, which is why we built the program. Uh, you can learn from all of the, uh, all, all of the errors that I've made in the past. Yeah, and I think just to tag on to that last one, right, is is we would never advocate you just effectively turn the keys in and walk walk away, right? Like, like at the end of the day, you've got reputation and other things at stake here. And, uh, you know, the idea is it's better better for you to find someone else who can run the company and support whatever obligations it has. You know, uh, it's more of like a moral philosophy than anything. Um, but, yeah, negotiate with the, with the seller uh, if you get in a pinch. Um, and try to try to come to some some terms and agreement on that. But well, guys, awesome, awesome week of Q and A. Kosan, you're an all star, my friend, and uh, we're really thankful uh, to have had had you here this week. Uh, for those in the Dealmaker Academy program, you get to see this this fine looking fella and this really smart dealmaker every single week uh, on our on our weekly group coaching calls. Dealmaker Academy is, is just a, an absolute awesome program helping people really achieve the next level of their dealmaking journey. Uh, so Kostan, really thankful that not only did you find that ad from Carl many years ago, but you've grown as a dealmaker and ultimately have elevated to, uh, to be part of our family and our team. And we're, we're really thankful to have you. Glad that you're having me, guys. It's really, it's really a pleasure working with you both. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, and just listen. Remember, you are one deal away from changing your life. Just listen to Kostan's story, right? His life was changed for the better uh, after he did his first deal, and he's subsequently done other deals. So just remember, you're one deal away from changing your life. So take action. Be an action taker. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a superb weekend wherever you are. Um, enjoy the weather if it's going to be sunny. And we'll see you on Monday on Facebook Live for uh, for Mindset Monday. So uh, don't miss that. It's uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, sorry, 4 p.m. UK, 11 a.m. Eastern daylight time. And we will uh, we'll see you then. Have a great weekend. Until then, bye for now, guys. Have a great weekend, all. Bye.